you know, I, I'm, I keep asking people to make a case for Florida. Um, I want your assessment of the Gators, and, and you know, I know I know it's a rivalry game, but how does that how do they match up right now to what, what we see on the other side? They don't match up great. I mean, it's especially given the way they played recently, right? You know, last time out, given that you know, LSU finds their run game to the tune of like 321 yards or something on the ground, and they hadn't done that. I don't think they've been in triple digits all season rushing, but two other times. Um, and you look at Georgia where – so who's in at quarterback? It won't matter much if you can't play run defense better than the Gators did versus the Tigers of LSU. I, uh, I do think, though, that there's a, there is opportunity. Absolutely there's opportunity. Uh, and, I, and I do think that the head coach and play caller at Florida is a really good play caller. And I think he can scheme offense very well. And you look at last year – and you would think that losing Kyle Pitts during that game would be a pretty significant shock to their offensive system. And yet, uh, they still persisted. Now, Kyle Trask at quarterback, uh, and there was certainly a comfort level there in the passing game that they had long since established in that year. They haven't done that this year, especially at quarterback. There is not a comfort level at all. It's different. It's totally different from what Georgia has at quarterback, in my view, and that at Florida, it's sitting there going, you know, which one of these guys do we have to put out there first, so to speak? Which one of these guys do we – are we going to have to go with? Whereas Georgia is more of a luxury, which is, I, I don't know, you're winning with this guy. You could win with the other guy. He's been on the shelf. For Florida on offense, they're going to have to – I think Dan Mullen's going to have to have one of, if not his best performances as a play caller to put not only his quarterbacks in a position to succeed – but also the balance of that offense. And he's done that before. We've seen him do that before. He's had a week in the bye. I do think it's more difficult if he hasn't established, I'm going to do that in and around this guy at QB. And I don't know that he's been afforded that opportunity or created that opportunity to be that definitive that this is going to be the guy we're building our game plan around. Let's talk about this bye week, and, and you know, you've been in, in this game, obviously, and you know, how, how does this week go? Because, uh, not, not this week, last week, I mean, you, it's, yeah. it's, it seems like it's, it's such a big game that, you know, at, at what point do you finally just flip the switch? Yeah, I, I think that, I think both these teams uh, were already pointed towards this game. No coach will ever, ever admit to that, and no player will probably acknowledge it either. But they know. They know. And, and it's – I think both coaches have said – I know Kirby said, you know, the rankings and this isn't about rankings. And it isn't about rankings. Uh, and yet, you can't ignore the fact that one team's number one in the country right now. And we've seen, you know, the way her history plays out and you throw the record books out in a rivalry game. That almost holds up in this one, though, when you have an undefeated team coming into this game where they oftentimes do not come out undefeated on the other side of this game. It definitely gives you pause. But it's been, you know, a distinct departure, one from the other, from a trajectory standpoint. We look at the respective programs. I mean, as these numbers would indicate, where Georgia uh, clearly on a, a uh, upward bending uh, line, so to speak, whereas Florida, um, they've been kind of sputtering, to say the least. I don't want to say plateaued. Last year was anomalous, I think, in a lot of ways. The defense was not great. The run game was not there. And you were that superlative in the passing offense where uh, you won a bunch of games if you're Florida, but it was not a balanced team. And it doesn't seem to be a very balanced team uh, this year either. It's convenient and, and popular, and I don't know what else, because uh, you're an analyst and I'm, I'm just a talking head, uh, it, to criticize Todd Grantham. Yeah. Uh, when you when you see them play and you've done their games and you've watched them, what what are you seeing from him that you think makes people so uh, antsy? You know, I, I think part of it is I think part of it's informed by how um, other they were offensively a season ago. That was if it weren't for Alabama, you're looking at what Florida did offensively last year and you're going, that was a singular performance. That was an unbelievable offensive performance with a guy at quarterback that no one was talking about and a guy in Kyle Pitts who, who people in the league certainly knew about, but nobody nationally was paying attention to Kyle Pitts. And yet they built this offense that was you know, second only to Alabama, quite literally and figuratively in that regard. And then so in contrast to that was this underperforming defense. You could say that. I would say that again this year from a statistical standpoint, yes, 
But when you look at some of the attrition and the uh, absences that they've endured, which you know everyone's going to say, hey, look, you're banged up. Everybody's banged up at this point in the season. They've been banged up for a while, and I don't know that they were equipped from a personnel standpoint to endure a whole, a whole lot of hits from their frontline players. Kyrie Elam going out, that's bigger, I think, than just his position because you get into some of your sub packages and it changes how you would allocate that secondary. And so because he is not in, he wasn't or hasn't been available, that changes the way that you can deploy in the back end. So it's not, it's not an excuse, it's a reason. It is a real reason. Uh, and is it concerning? Uh, I would have to say that it is, but only in that now you've got an offense that has returned to earth and because of that, you don't have that padding, so to speak, where it might gloss over some of your defensive deficiencies. But you know, part of it's also a function of having an offensive-minded head coach. And we've seen that with most teams, where even at Auburn, right, with Gus Malzahn, offensive-minded head coach, they were winning games with defense. They weren't winning it with, uh, with their offense. And they not really, what, since Nick Marshall has there, was there, that you could say, man, this, this Auburn offense is really up on its skis. But they were so good defensively that they were still finding ways to win games. And you think, you know, Bo Nix, he goes in there, wins the Iron Bowl, and it's certainly not because that offense was unstoppable. It was a good defensive football team. Uh, but because you have an, uh, an offensive-minded head coach, I do think that uh, oftentimes, and in an offensive-minded game, uh, defenses are easy to, I think, not vilify, but almost point towards as, you know what, not only is a defensive struggle game boring, but also is if you give up points and we somehow lose in an offensive game, that somehow, you know, those are the guys that catch the most bullets, it feels like. Part of it's, I think, of just where we are with the game right now. Thanks for watching ESPN on YouTube. For live streaming sports and premium content, subscribe to ESPN+. Plus.